Early in the morning of the 23rd of March 1921, the Irish Republican Army in County Roscommon ambushed a convoy of British military accompanied by the RIC as they travelled between Strokestown and Longford. The ambush took place in the townland of Scramogue, a few miles outside of Strokestown. The ambush was deemed of such significance that Ernie O'Malley included it in his authoritative book Raids and Rallies. To tell us about the background to the engagement and the ambush itself, we have a proud Roscommon man, an expert on the period, Henry Owens. Uh, before I deal with the ambush, I want to talk a little about the general situation in Roscommon leading up to the 1990 and 1920 period. Um, County Roscommon was not one of the most active areas for action during the Black and Tan War. Nevertheless, attacks did take place and casualties were inflicted on Crown forces during this time. Uh, Roscommon, I suppose they were slow to get started for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, I suppose the fact that most of the county is open countryside, unlike we we'll say Cork or Tipperary or those other southern counties, they had a lot of mountainous regions and um, Roscommon didn't have, have that type of terrain, so it left it uh, unsuitable for guerrilla warfare. That was one reason. Secondly, a lack of leadership at the start and thirdly, lack of arms and equipment. Now, Roscommon geographically is a north-south elongated county. So for organisational reasons, it was divided into two brigades. Uh, you had a border across the middle and you had the North Roscommon Brigade and the South Roscommon Brigade. So um, at the end of 1918, we had the general election and the great Sinn Féin victory. And, of course, IRA volunteers were involved in the elections. Now, the year before that, Roscommon uh, returned the first abstentionist TD when Count Plunkett was elected in a by-election for the constituency of North Roscommon. Uh, the reason for this uh, swing towards abstentionism and Sinn Féin was it was a sort of a protest vote because there was a threat of conscription and uh, that would have swung a lot of people towards Sinn Féin at that time. Now, the elections were only a sideshow, really, and uh, the victory of Sinn Féin was a convenient event to have happened. And it was uh, a coincidence that it occurred at the same time uh, as the advent of military struggle. Because the IRA volunteers were going to launch their war on Britain anyway, regardless of the mandate. Because um, they were already raiding for arms as far back as uh, the beginning of 1918. There were arms raids in the counties. And Ernie O'Malley was sent to Roscommon and he spent um, a good term during the summer of 1918 organizing companies and battalions. And this laid the groundwork for the later activity. Um, by 1920, uh, the RIC were coming under attack throughout Ireland from IRA volunteers in different parts of the country. So there was a policy then, the, the RIC withdrew from the small rural barracks and they were all moved into the bigger towns to much stronger fortifications. And this made it harder for the IRA to attack those bastions because they were all um, steel shuttered, sandbagged and barbed wire around them. So they were very uh, impregnable. But uh, at Easter, Easter 1920, the IRA decided to um, burn all the, the, the vacated barracks and on, on the, the night before Easter Sunday in Roscommon, Roscommon played his part. There was a lot of barracks burned to the ground that time. So that was the first sort of uh, concerted move against uh, the RIC. 
that was that was around Easter, yeah. Now it was maybe around the summer then, 1920. The IRA being Roscommon, they began to to uh, make a bigger impact. And between July and September, there were three ambushes on the RIC, um, resulting in three fatal police casualties. Now the IRA also lost one member in those attacks. And by by the the end of the summer into the maybe the, the, the autumn time, the, the war moved up a bit, moved up a gear because in October um, there was a, a, a major ambush at Four Mile House and four RIC men were killed in this ambush. This was the biggest ambush to date. Now the only drawback was um, they didn't the IRA didn't succeed in capturing any arms because the driver of the, the uh, tender, he, uh, he was uninjured and he was able to drive through. But there, was, there were four casualties inflicted on the RIC. And, of course, in the aftermath of the, those attacks, uh, there was, you had the reprisal killings. Sometimes random people could be taken out of their house and shot. And in, more, in a lot of cases, uh, there were, they happened to be IRA volunteers. And this had a demoralizing effect on the movement. And activity sort of tailed off towards the end of 1920. And around that time, Sean Connolly, he was an organizer sent from GHQ. He was a Longford man and he arrived in Roscommon towards the end of 1920. I started to, to revitalize the volunteers and get some action going again. Now, Connolly spent a fair length of time in North Roscommon, and he worked closely with the battalions that were attached to Elfin, Crossna, and Strokestown. They were the 2nd Battalion, 3rd Battalion, and 4th Battalion. And he trained them in the use of explosives and electrical detonators, which was very new to them that time. And he assisted them in, in uh, uh, attacking police patrols and making attacks on barracks and as best as could at the time. And he also, uh, Connolly also moved into the South Roscommon Brigade and he met up with Pat Madden and Luke Duffy and Frank Simons and all them active men in, the, in that. They, they had a flying column going there in uh, South Roscommon. And he even examined the road from Roscommon all the way to Lanesborough to see was there any point on the road that an ambush could be staged. But uh, seemingly there was no suitable spot. And then he examined the road from, he moved into North Roscommon again, he, he examined the road from Strokestown to Longford. And he identified a, a, an ideal place in his mind where an ambush could be staged. It was at a place called Scramog. And at, at that location, there was a sharp 90-degree bend in the road. Now, at that time, the road would be much narrower than it is today, so um, motorised traffic would have to slow down considerably to, to take the bend. And uh, it was just at the at the foothills of Schlieve Bourne where the ground rises, so it would be an ideal place for the volunteers to... If they had to retreat, they could retreat back up the mountain. So uh, the, the spot was uh, well examined and well mapped out and all their details planned out how it, how it would uh, take place. But in the middle of all this, Connolly was transferred to Leithram. And he was doing similar work in Leithram, uh, organising companies and battalions, getting them on a war footing. And it was in Leithram that he met his death because his, he had a column. Uh, they were um, assembled at a place called Selton Hill and they were all in a safe house. And information was given to the Crown forces of his, of his presence there and the uh, military came out from Carrick and Shannon and uh, surrounded the place and there was a big shootout and Connolly was killed, and five of his comrades were all wiped out in Selton Hill. 
So that was that was uh, Connolly's sad end. So that um, the news of 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 Connolly's death was a, it, it struck a hard blow with the with the lads around Strokestown because they had got to know him very well and he was a friendly type of fella. And uh, when he was going to Leithram, he even mentioned that he might come back again to them and plan more attacks. Anyway, that was, uh, Connolly was killed in, in uh, Selton Hill in Leithram and uh, that was a, a sad occasion. Anyway, it was after that, after the death of Connolly that uh, Sean Levy, Sean Levy was OC of the 3rd Battalion, Strokestown. And uh, he arranged a meeting of the, the local battalion officers to discuss this proposed ambush that Connolly had started about. And um, he called a meeting anyway of the, of the officers and they decided that they would go ahead and, and try and carry out this ambush. Now, as Scramog is very close to the border between North and South Roscommon, the, the other brigade, the other flying column, the South Roscommon flying column, was only a couple of miles away. So they invited officers from the flying column of the South Roscommon brigade. Uh, they invited them to a, a, another meeting. So that meeting took place in Levy's house. Levy was the OC. In, in the townland of Ashbrook, which is beside Scramo. And at the meeting were uh, Martin Fallon, he commanded the Strokestown Battalion Flying Column, and Pat Madden, who commanded the South Roscommon Flying Column, also in the were Luke Duffy and Frank Simons of the South Roscommon Flying Column. Um, at the meeting... They told, some of them mentioned to Sean Levy that when this ambush is over, there'll be reprises and Levy's house could go up in smoke and smoke a lot more of them in the vicinity because they were very close to the ambush site. But Levy seemed to, didn't give a damn. He said, he says, if the ambush is a success, he didn't, he couldn't care less about the house. So... So the day was set then for um, for the ambush. So the next thing was they um, they put a few scouts on the road to watch monitor the traffic on that road from Strokestown to Longford, and, uh, and they, they watched it for a week or so, and they found that usually in the morning. So early in the morning, there would be military traffic on it. Now, there could be one, two, or sometimes three in a convoy. But it's usually in the morning time. So they decided then that they would uh, set a date. So they chose their date as March 23rd, which happened to be Spy Wednesday, the Wednesday before Easter. Rifles and shotguns, uh, they were the main armament. And some rifles had to be brought in from other areas to supplement their own because they wouldn't have a big supply. Now, the old road to Longford is now known as the N5. And it is the main Dublin-Westport road, Westport to Ballinair road. And now, since that, it has been widened and upgraded and partly rerouted in places. But at that time, it was a narrow uh, money, like a secondary road. And, of course, at, at, Scr at Scrammo, you had the sharp bend. So, uh, now, this road, as I, as I said, it's, it was regularly, regularly used by British forces. And to attack one of those convoys with a small number of men or with limited arms, with limited firepower, that would be a daunting exercise. But the main reason why, of course, the main reason why an ambush was never attempted here was because they didn't have arms enough or they didn't have men enough. But on this occasion, those two flying columns mustered, two very active flying columns, the flying column that was attached to the 3rd Brigade, 3rd Battalion, Strokestown, and, of course, the South Roscommon 
one that was attached to the 3rd Battalion South Trust Common Brigade. Two very active uh, flying columns led by two very capable commanders. Now, they, they were mustered for the job and um, a lot of other personnel were, were brought in for uh, peripheral work like uh, road blocking and scout duty and all that type of stuff. Anyway, the, the date was set March 23rd, and uh, they were all set for, for the, the ambush. Now, March 23rd, it dawned a typically cold, raw, but it was a dry March morning. And since long before daybreak, men of the two flying columns had been in the, at the ambush site, preparing the ground for the coming attack. Now, civilians, the first thing that I had to do was remove civilians that were in a couple of houses that were close to the ambush site. So they were roused out of their beds and told to evacuate. And they were all brought up to another house further up the road, a little by road. And there was an armed guard placed on them and none of them was allowed to leave that spot. Meanwhile, this was going on. Uh, there were other men digging a trench inside the fence that faced the main road. See, you can imagine the, the, the right angle bend. Uh, there'd be a, a, a ditch facing the road back to Strokestown. So they dug a trench inside that fence and they, they banked the earth up on a, a, to create a sort of a rampart where they could conceal themselves behind it. And in the house, there was a house close to the, very close to the bend. So they, they, they raised the roof a little um, facing the road and propped it up and uh, made a few holes in the top of the walls, top of the front wall, where you could put a rifle through and you'd have a good view of the, the road to Strokestown. So this, all this work was going on. Then there was another barn. Um, it, it led out to a, this barn led to a, a little lane that, that, that led up the mountain, up Sleeve Barn. So they cut a hole in the back wall of this barn as a sort of an escape route so that men wouldn't get trapped inside or, or uh, you know, they'd have, a, they'd have a quick a quick exit. So this all this work was going on like from dark of the morning, you know, from probably 3 a.m three o'clock in the morning on. Anyway, by 6.30, 7 o'clock, all this work was done and they were all in their, uh, the OCs were uh, putting them in their different positions and telling them what they had to do. Uh, there was certain men were, riflemen were put in the in the house with the loopholes and uh, others were put behind the bank and uh, shotgun men and this, the shotgun men were put in a, in a position where they'd be in close proximity to the, the lorries when they get to stop them or whatever. Other riflemen had to be put up, and put, uh, they had to be positioned a bit further back up the hill, they sort of to guard the flanks and watch for encirclement. And uh, all that, when, when everything was in order, the waiting started then because they didn't know what or when um, military trucks were going to come. So in the meantime, some men went, uh, they went up to Levy's and they had tea and refreshments on turns. Three or four or five would maybe would, would go up and grab a mug of tea and a, a bit of, that time now to be probably a quarter of a soda cake and they'd rush back and maybe let up a couple of more lads and that's sort of thing because I'd say they were getting a bit hungry at that time. Anyway, I think it would be around from between seven and half seven, a scout reported that there was a military vehicle approaching from the Strokestown direction. And he could see that it contained soldiers and police and, and a mounted machine gun on it. All these tinders carried a mounted machine gun, a hotch, a hotch kiss, and there'd be a, a soldier man in that, that machine. So every man was in position, of course, ready, ready. They knew what they had to do. And uh, the signal to open fire, Madden told them that he'd blow a whistle and that'd be the signal to open fire. So Madden 
had spent time in Dublin, you see, and uh, he had um, he had lots of experience of of ambushes because he uh, took part in attacks up there with the Dublin Active Service units, and he was well used to, and he knew the he knew the tactics like and knew what what to do. So when the lorry containing all the soldiers and police came along, it had to slow down a bit. But Madden let it come close, very close. And then he blew the whistle. And immediately, everyone opened fire. All arms, shotguns, rifles, the whole lot. And uh, the driver the driver was hit and shot. He, he must be shot dead because the, the, um, the lorry just careered into the ditch. Because he was hit very, he was probably the first man hit. And the machine gunner, he was the next man that was hit. Now, he did fire, he did get to fire a burst of machine gun fire at the house. He he must doubt that that's where the main fire was coming from. And he did let one burst of fire at the house, but it didn't injure anyone. And um, the, the machine gunner, he was, yeah, he was hit by either a, a shotgun or a rifle, but he was put out of action straight away. Now, all the others on the truck, they jumped off and into the field on the far side and, and got in behind the ditch. And then a short gun battle took place. Not very long, because after a, a, short, a few minutes, maybe, they, they shouted that they were going to surrender and they, and they raised their hands, threw down their rifles and they put up their hands. And uh, they came out on the road with their hands up. And uh, Madden and the rest of the lads came out and took the surrender and they disarmed them. But then as they were there uh, taking the surrender and collecting arms, some of them noticed a British army officer a distance away where he ran down through the field on the far side and he was running in a zigzag manner and he was trying to get make his way back to the, the headquarters in Strokestown House. That was where they were billeted. So they fired at him. Now he was gone a good distance, but a few of them had rifles and they, they, they fired at him and eventually they hit him. And he fell wounded and died there. Now he was Captain Wilfred Peake and he was the commander of the Ninth Lancers that were billeted there in Strokes Stroke House. And he had his second in command, uh, Lieutenant Tennant. Now he was hit on the lorry, so... He didn't. He didn't get away at all. So he died as well, and I think two other members of Crown forces were killed. So there was four, four lost their lives there in the ambush. Now, uh, two men in, in civilian clothes came out on the road. They had been on the truck as well, but they didn't at the start. They didn't know who these men were. They were some civilians. So. Madden and the men assumed that there must have been IRA prisoners that was picked up someplace and they were being brought for questioning or brought for some some other uh, some other duty. But anyway, they assumed they were, they were IRA prisoners. And uh, the, when the, Madden said they'd move off quick from there because Stroke Sound House isn't that far away. And if, if the word got back... Uh, the, the Lancers would be out on horseback and, and trucks and they could surround the place. So they were advised to move up the mountain quickly. And they brought the two, the two civilians with them. But it wasn't long till they found out the two civilians happened to be black and tans. Now, it's a funny thing, they were, the black and tans were being brought, brought by the military to Longford for a court martial for some minor offence. And that's that's how it happened. They were caught up in the ambush. Now, at this stage, the two black and tans had seen all the men that was involved and knew some of their names. So this placed Madden in a bit of a dilemma. So he um, he conferred with Luke Duffy and Frank Simons. Uh, Luke Duffy was the vice OC of the column and Frank Simons was the um, adjutant. So he consulted with them about the two tens. What what were they going to do with them? So anyway, after a bit of debate, they decided that to, if they were to release them, 
And if if any of the column happened to be arrested, these two men could identify them. And their lives would be in danger. But they'd be more than likely executed if they're identified as taken, taken part in the ambush. So it was decided that they'd have to be executed. So one prisoner was taken by the South Common men and they brought him away across the, into their own area and he was executed that evening and buried in a bog. And the other prisoner was taken by the North Common men and they brought him to the Shannon and uh, they had planned to get a boat and bring him across to County Longford and that he'd be shot in Longford and that his body would be left in Longford. And this would throw the, sort of confuse the authorities when the body would be found to know how he happened to be in Longford. But anyway, the, the prisoner that they brought to the Shannon, he, he um, while some of them was gone off to pick up a boat or procure a boat, he suddenly struck the man that was guarding him, gave him an upper course, and your man fell in sort of days, and your man, the tan, jumped into the river, jumped into the Shannon, and tried to swim swim away like for freedom. But so they had to go in and shoot him in the Shannon, and his body was swept away with the current. Now, this was the harsh reality of the war. So that was that. Now, of course, after the ambush, um, when the word was radio, at that time they had radio, radio uh, con- uh, contact with other other towns. So the news was radioed to all the major towns around the boat and immediately reinforcements or search parties arrived on the scene to, to uh, comb out the area looking for the men. And by that evening, mind you, they had, uh, they had three men, they picked up three men that, that evening. And one of the men was a man called Dick Dick Hughes, he was called Cushy Hughes. That was his nickname, Cushy Hughes. So Cushy and uh, the other two men were um, Pat Malouli and Brian Nangle. Now, they were in the, in the ambush. And they were caught with uh, revolver and ammunition. So straight away, that was that convicted them. But uh, the funny one about Cushy Hughes... Cushy Hughes, when he was brought into Roscommon, and uh, he was, I don't know whether the accused him of being in the ambush, but he had no arms on him or anything, but he produced um, a British Army pension book. Cushy was in the Great War and fought on the Western Front. And when he came back, when the war was over, Madden asked him to join the column because he'd be well used to firearms. So, of course, when he produced his British Army um, pension book, he was relieved straight away. But uh, the other two men, Maluli and Nangle, they were, they were caught uh, with uh, arms and, and, and ammunition. And they were brought into Roscommon and they received a brutal beating from the British soldiers. They were battered black and blue and questioned. But uh, fair play, they never gave away any information. Oh, they were badly, badly beaten up. They were brought away to the to the Curra and and to at Lone and afterwards. Uh, Nangle, I think, he got a sentence. He was sentenced to ten years or something for possession. But uh, Maluli was charged. I don't know how it was, but Maluli was charged with the death of military and 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 police at Scramog, and he was going to be court martialed. And. Uh, Later on in the year, in uh, that was March, in a couple of months after, in May, he was still he was badly injured with the, with the the beaten up he got, and he got some other he got a skin rash, and he was he was moved to the hospital unit in the Atlone military barracks, and he got friendly with uh, one of the guards that was guarding him, and uh, anyway he worked with that he, he, the, it seems there was some sort of building work going on in the in the barracks complex. And he asked the guard would he be able to leave a ladder out someplace near a wall. And the 
Gerd said he would. Gerd was friendly enough. So one night, Malouli, when the, the, he was in his hospital room, there was no guard in the room, but there was a guard outside the door. But he quietly op- opened the window. You see, it wasn't a barred window like a cell. It was like if it was a hospital unit. He was able to quietly squeeze open the window and he put on an overcoat and he slipped out and he dropped down. He had to drop a big distance now to the ground and he hurted his back in the drop, but he, he scrambled across to where the, your man left the leather and he put the leather up to the wall and he climbed up and he pulled the leather up and he got down the other side and he had to scale another wall and another wall and eventually he got out of the barracks and made his way to a safe house where he was looked after. But he was lucky because if if he had remained there, he knew it himself. And if he was court martialed, he'd be sentenced to death and executed. But he got away and never was never was got. And of course, the other the next day, then when they found out who Maluli was and where he was from, the next day there was a, a big uh, big raid on the Strokestown district. And black and tans and police, they went to Maluli's house. And Maluli's brother, Michael, lived at home with his mother there. And uh, there was an uncle in the house. But Michael was, um, he was knocking around the house or the farm, but he was uh, arrested. And they hauled him out to the gar- the back garden. And the, the old uncle was there and the, the old uncle pleaded with him not, not to shoot him because he was the only son left at home. But... The pleas didn't uh, make any difference. They shot him outside in the garden against a cock of hay. And he was, he was only 24 years old. So it was a sad and uh, traumatic experience for the Maluli family. Now, the, the, apart from that, there wasn't, there was no mass reprisals, nor no mass burnings. Now, the house uh, that the attack took place from I think it was used to store hay. So I think that house was burned. And uh, the house, the hay and all was burned. But uh, there was no other, nothing of major, no major incident after that. Now, of course, IRA activity continued in the county right up to the truce in July. And the western part of County Roscommon paid a high price during this time with reprisal killings. The, uh, the month of April witnessed terror raids by Black and Tans and RAC and the shooting dead of an IRA volunteer and uh, a middle-aged farmer who happened to be Church of Ireland. And he was taken out of his house and shot dead and on, on, on a night in April as well. And then later on in April, um, there was a three mem- There was three members of a flying column, and there were uh, there was a bit of a shootout in a place called Lock Lane, Lock Lane Wood. Uh, one of them was arrested. And cap- the three of them were captured after the shootout. One of them was arrested and brought brought away to Castlery, and he, he finished up in jail. But the other two were summarily executed in the wood. And their names were Sean Bergen and Stephen McDermott, uh, fairly well known. There was a song made up about it, the woodlands of Loch Glynn. So that, that's what went on over in, 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 in that part of, of uh, Roscommon. And uh, even as far back as 1920, there was a lot of volunteers and civilians taken out of their beds and some of them were shot in bed uh, over in, in the west part of the county. The trouble was over there, there seemed to be a lot of paid informers and they were creating havoc with the IRA organisation. They were relaying information to the police about volunteer activity and and where safe houses were and all that type of stuff. Um, now many of those agents were eliminated but some of them were still working up up nearly to the truth. You see, the Black and Tans and the military in uh, Castlery, they were billeted in the barracks there and in Castlery, and uh, they were aided by a very dutiful RIC sergeant. 
And he knew every lane and back road around Castlery and Loch Lynn and all that West Roscommon area. And he he accompanied them out on their, to go out on a nightly raid to know where they were going, exactly where they were going, and, and into a house and they'd find maybe uh, a volunteer or two that were on their own. And they'd be shot shot into the bed or shot outside the door. And this, the unit became known as the Castlery Murder Gang. And they played havoc over there with, with uh, these assassinations. But the sadistic sergeant, he finally, he even carried out some of the shootings himself. But he finally got his just desserts on the 11th of July, 1921, just hours before the truce came into operation. He spent most of his time in the barracks and only went to, the, how, to his own house when it was very safe to do so. But it seems, uh, coming up to the truce, time he let his guard down a bit because he came out of his house that morning intending to go to the barracks and he had a bicycle with him but before he could mount the bicycle two volunteers emerged and he was shot dead on the street they were waiting for him there and they knew that the, the truce was coming into operation and that if the truce was all if the truce had come he couldn't be uh, he couldn't be assassinated so he was dealt with hours just hours before the truce now I'd say that's nearly concludes all the the, um, the background and the um, events after the ambush so thank you very much uh, thank you Henry that was Henry Owens delivering that very enlightening, comprehensive account of the ambush at Scramogue, the background to the event and the follow-up.